Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Vegan Spirituality Online Gathering. My name is Lisa Levinson, and I'm one of your hosts this evening. I work for In Defense of Animals, and we're just so thrilled to present this program to you this evening. So we started Vegan Spirituality to explore veganism as a spiritual practice. And that's what we do in these online gatherings and also in in-person gatherings, which happen in groups across the country. There are vegan spirituality groups, and there may be one near you. You can find out by going to veganspirituality.com and clicking on the, the join groups tab, and then you'll find out. And if there isn't one, you can certainly reach out to us at veganspirituality at gmail.com to start one in your area. So tonight we're absolutely thrilled to share a very special speaker with you. First of all, I'd like to introduce my co-host, Judy Carmen, who is the author of Peace to All Beings and Homo Ahimsa. Hi, Judy. Yay. So, Judy, if you're ready to unmute and share. I, yeah, I thought I was good, but <laughs> I didn't quite unmute. Um, I, yes, we're so excited to be here with our wonderful guest, Zira Abbas. Is that how you say your last name, Zira? That was perfect, yes. Oh, good. Okay. Zira is the founder and volunteer president of a nonprofit social enterprise, Studio 89 a fair trade vegan cafe and community hub providing a free space for events, workshops, and resources with a specific focus on social justice activism and uh, youth leadership development. So Studio 89 also aims to benefit humans, animals, and the environment with their community programs that support marginalized communities um, Zira has extensive experience in operating and developing nonprofit initiatives, building organizational capacity, and establishing social enterprises. Her newest endeavor is a nonprofit called Green Islam, which strives to highlight the incompatibility between modern consumption and lifestyle practices with Islamic teachings. In turn, seeking to inspire Muslims to re-engage and act in accordance with the ethical spirit of Islam, which is so exciting. Zira has previously engaged in theater, television hosting, and production, so it brings a lot of skills to this, and, um, as, and she adds a force for social change through generating meaningful awareness and action. She aims to further explore media production with her documentary, Halalified, Halalified, right? Did I say that right, Sarah? Halalified and other future ventures. While traveling, Zara enjoys narrow cobblestone streets, ancient architecture, cuddling street animals, and volunteering with various charity organizations to advance her knowledge about community care from a holistic lens. Excitingly, also, Zero will be speaking on our Interfaith Vegan Coalition panel, which is going to be called Engaging Communities to Inspire Compassion for All, and that is going to take place in August at the Parliament of World Religions, and Zero has agreed to be with us on that panel, so we're very, very excited about that. So um, that is uh, inter a minuscule introduction of all the amazing things Zira is doing. And to get started, I'd like to ask you, Zira, how did you go vegan? What inspired you to go vegan? Thank you, Judy. First of all, I just want to say thank you both so much for organizing this and for having me here. It is such an honor to uh, speak with you about this topic. It's one of my favorite topic, <laughs> in fact. Um, to answer your question, what made me go vegan was when I finally connected um, the reality of animal agriculture with the teachings of Islam. I had a moment um, where many of you may have seen the short video called Dairy is Scary on YouTube. 
I remember watching that and thinking, this can't possibly be true. It's so horrible. How, how could this be? But of course, where, where do cows, how can cows lactate enough for all of us to have milk available to us all of the time? Where are these cows anyway? And so thoughts that had crept up um, because I was already vegetarian. I went vegetarian um, in my mid twenties, which was radical enough in, in the Muslim community. Um, but when I, when I realized that, um, you know, what, what the video was outlining was accurate. And the way I came to that, by the way, is I reached out to a Facebook group of dairy farmers and um, I asked them to uh, share with me their opinions on that video. They said, can you, can you set me straight? What are some of the practices? And of course they said, no, we love our cattle. You know, our livelihood is attached to their well-being. Of course, we take really good care of them. We love them, we care for them wholeheartedly, um, all their medical needs, this, that, and the other. And so I was almost convinced. And then one of the dairy farmers I was speaking with sent me their uh, cattle rearing manual, which was standard. It was so long ago. I don't remember if it was the Canadian standard or the Ontario standard, but this is supposed to be standard across the board for cattle farmers and particularly dairy farmers. And I remember reading in there um, a line about, uh, in very clinically, clinical terms, it outlines how cows are very social creatures. And so when the calves are separated from the mothers, uh, it's a good idea to keep the mothers together because they comfort each other and that helps with their lactation levels. And when I read that, um, for me, it connected immediately with something that it says in the Quran about how animals are made in communities just like us. And that was the moment for me where I said, oh, this, is, this doesn't jive with my religious beliefs and my spiritual beliefs. And that's when I decided to go vegan. Wow. Yeah, that's, that was a big event for me too, uh, because I kind of denied the whole dairy thing for a long time while I was vegetarian. And, but to realize, yeah, to come face to face with that is, it's horrifying. It really is, especially like you said, so many cows, there had to be so many to produce all that milk. So um, well, tell us um, on to a, a more cheerful topic. Tell us about your vegan cafe. Where is it and and how does it work? And are you there all the time or how? just tell us all about it? I'm sure we'd all love to be in a town where there is one. <laughs> Well, if you ever visit Toronto, please pop into the city of Mississauga, which is right next to Toronto. Um, there is a, a little community hub that wasn't always vegan, but it always aimed to be good for humans, animals, and the environment. In fact, our logo used to say when we first launched in 2014, it said humans, animals, planet, right under Studio 89. And we very naively spent quadruple the cost and made a, a fraction of, of the profits on what we were selling, which was organic dairy and cheese, organic chicken, thinking that these were coming from happy animals, very naively believing that these are coming from happy animals and small farms, and therefore it was okay. And what we were doing was, you know, the, the right thing. And when we realized that uh, the chicken isn't in fact, coming from any kind of pasture at all, uh, despite it being free range. And um, what, what uh, the dairy industry is all about, we very quickly uh, decided first to go vegetarian and then vegan. Um, we were the second, I think the second vegan place in the city of Mississauga, which is quite a big city, uh, about 750,000 people at the time, I believe. And so, our board wasn't on board. <laughs> um, we, we definitely had to um, climb some hurdles, but because our values very clearly said humans, animals, environment, there was just no denying that we couldn't continue selling 
that. Um, and it was definitely a challenge for a grassroots, a small nonprofit organization that is struggling to get by. But thankfully, we have come a very, very long way since uh, COVID was a really hard time for us. So we're still climbing out of the red and it'll take us probably this year. Um, but the organization is stabilizing. We've got an excellent board. Um, we've got a wonderful uh, youth staff team and our cafe does tons of programs where we do two main things. One is we're free space for anybody in the community because or people need space to mobilize, to come together and to experiment with the mobilizing as well. And the second thing we do is we run a ton of programs on our own. Um, oftentimes it's that's identifying gaps in our community, supports that are needed for marginalized demographics and creating programs to address them. Wow, so is it open all the time or how does it work? Is it just on a certain schedule? It is open seven days a week, um, morning to night. Uh, we have event bookings typically, so we close around 9 p.m. And um, we're still uh, getting back to or finding our new normal as an organization. Our previous location, just to give you a, a kind of picture of, of what it used to be, this place, we had about 650 over 650 bookings in our space per year. What? So it was a very, very busy community hub because free spaces just aren't easy to come by. And um, people need space to, to gather. We had, I believe, over 80 nonprofit community partners in our city. So one of the things uh, I think we do well is build partnerships with local nonprofit organizations. So how does it, uh, you say that uh, it involves social justice, that that's a big part of it, but it's also vegan. And so uh, do you weave that together with uh, a lot of the programs that you have or are a lot of the, the groups that come not vegan? And, uh, a very good question. It's a it's a new endeavor for us to um, venture down the path of vegan advocacy. What we were doing oh. before the pandemic, we had our monthly vegan potluck. We had uh, run an event, which was my favorite event, uh, in the uh, Islamic holy month of Ramadan in 2019. We organized iftar is the evening meal when we open our fast. So we had organized an interfaith zero waste plant-based iftar and we had about 180 people attend we had lectures on building community uh, we had lectures on environment care in islam as well as animal care and animal rights in islam um, and it was very very eye-opening i had received tons of comments after after the event um, from muslims saying they had just hadn't taken the time to really consider our impact on the environment and on animals. And I had comments from non-Muslims saying that a lot of stereotypes they had around Muslims and Islam were really quite shattered through this event. One person said I was really quite Islamophobic uh, before attending this event. So it was absolutely phenomenal. And then COVID happened. So we haven't launched it just yet. Um, however, the next time we do do this event, I believe it will be an international initiative where we partner with Muslim vegan organizations in places like Singapore, Morocco, Lebanon, and um, we ensure that we, we do it collectively on that day. So I don't think we have the time to pull it off this year, but we're already in conversations with these organizations. So hopefully next year. That is so awesome. And, and it's so amazing that you had such a, a broad kind of audience. Uh, you weren't just speaking to the choir at Precisely. all. So that was really great. So, so tell us what green Islam is and how does that fit in? Do you uh, bring that into the cafe a lot? Well, the cafe is uh, interestingly in the city of Mississauga has a 50% um, BIPOC population. So we do have a large Muslim community and particularly the neighborhood we're in, we do have a large Muslim community. 
um, and, and that's why RFDR was so popular. Um, however, we realized as I was uh, chatting with fellow vegan Muslims in other parts of the world, we realized that a lot of us are having the same conversation. We're addressing the same concerns over and over again. There's a lot of misconceptions around veganism in the Muslim community. And so we thought the best way and myself particularly, I found myself repeating myself again and again and again with the same questions that come up again and again and again. And I thought we just need to create some kind of a resource, some kind of a, you know, um, videos, we need a documentary, we need um, a website where we can sort of collate all the um, academic research in this area. We need a website where we can uh, support Muslims that are looking to go vegan or are curious about veganism, um, highlight environmental and vegan organizations, as well as businesses um, and societies, organizations where they can find community, because finding community is such a big part of this journey as well, I find. Um, so many people I speak with in the Muslim community will say, well, you know, people just make fun of me and it's really hard to get um, options and so sometimes I'll eat this and sometimes I'll eat that not because I want to but because I feel pressured into it and so the only way to really combat that I think is with community we, we give each other power and strength so 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 this is uh the green islam uh is a resource basically um do you have what is the website and uh mm -hmm. what sort of resources do you have on there well, we are not live yet, but we're working on it. It's greenislam.org. And we hopefully should be launching in a couple of months. We are right now working on our branding and finalizing um, that. And then we are also putting together content for the website. And it's taking tons of hours of research um, to put together. We are um, making sure that uh, we're really targeting the Muslim audience with the climate crisis issue first, and then leading into how diet change plays a key role in caring for the environment. Um, there are clear Islamic instructions on both, taking care of animals, um, hence halal. Uh, the, it's, it's a guide, it's, a, it's rules on when eating uh, animals, how they should be slaughtered, and um, it, it's not an instruction to eat animals, which many people, um, I believe, mistake. And so we are uh, slowly working towards gathering all the academic research. Then we will work on creating some video content. But most importantly, there have been vegan Muslim organizations in various Muslim countries for a very long time now, and they've been doing work in their communities. So we'd like to be able to consolidate all of that in one area as a strong resource for anybody in the community. That sounds really, really helpful. Um, we've got some resources on our Interfaith Vegan Coalition uh, website also for different religions. And so uh, we'll definitely refer to yours once it once it goes live. So um, yeah, it sounds like there'd be tremendously valuable information there. So um, so you've got this, um, there's, what you're saying is that Islamic teachings actually support the idea of a vegan lifestyle that is also for the earth, for the animals, for people. So what are some of the teachings that uh, aim at that? Well, what's interesting is that um, well, the vast majority of people that I speak with from the Muslim community, their understanding is really based on uh, instructions or what life was like 1400, 1500 years ago now. Um, so what's interesting though is that when we're we're looking for and I, I think I've heard this from just about everyone in every religion when we're looking for something in any given religion we are able to find it if we're looking for you know ways to be more compassionate we will find that in our religion and if we're looking for an excuse to eat animals we'll also find that in the religion and so 
uh, Islam is, is quite clear on the treatment of animals to the, to the extent that the teachings are replete with stories where a pious Muslim um, does maybe one act of cruelty to an animal and they are sent to hellfire, whereas a non-Muslim or an impious Muslim will just, uh, you know, enact one act of kindness to an animal and they have all their sins forgiven and they go to heaven. And this is really quite uh, exemplary because it's not just one or two stories, it's story after story. There's also Islamic hadith, which are the sayings uh, and teachings of the prophet, peace be upon him, prophet Muhammad, our last prophet. And um, he said things like, a gentleman came up to him and said, there was this lamb and I, you know, didn't sacrifice him. I didn't kill him. I didn't slaughter him. And, and our, our beloved prophet responded, well, if you had mercy on the lamb, then Allah will have mercy on you twice. And so it, it's, it's quite significant, the teachings and the religion. Um, there's the concept of halal, much like uh, the kosher concept in the Jewish community is very similar in the regard that uh, the animal has to be very well cared for if one is to slaughter them. Of course, the animals today are housed in uh, factory farms. Those that are not housed in family farms um, means that they're taking up more land, more water um, for us to create this you know, grass fed option. Um, and so neither of those jive with the Islamic teachings today. And 1400 years ago in the desert, it was a very different time. It was a very different scenario. There were very few options. And there's still many places in the world that um, you know, can't have access the way many of us have access. And so a concept in Islam that's also really important is critical thinking. It's the hard, and um, you know, all we can do is is uh, teach about these concepts as much as possible, and hope that uh, it resonates with the compassion people already have in their hearts. Um, because for those that are looking for an excuse, they just say, "Well, it says in the Quran that we can eat animals, so we can eat animals." They don't um, want to to think beyond that, and. As vegans, we know that there can be some major cognitive dissidents when it comes to challenging people's dietary choices. People can take it very, very personally. Right. Yeah, we, we're all very familiar with that. And no matter what religion it is. And I mean, there's so many things in every religion that supports kindness and not harming animals. And yet there's many, many ways to get around it, as we know, um, depending on whether the person is religious or, or not, there's always something that they can come up with if they really want or don't get that piece of kindness to other beings and the, and the holiness of other beings. But I know um, the Prophet Muhammad, he said many things, right, about being kind to animals. So that's just, I guess, something that that people come up with excuses about. Can you have you got any examples of that where you've told somebody, well, the, the Prophet said this and they've already got it figured out why that doesn't matter? In almost every circumstance, in every circumstance where I've engaged in a debate with somebody about the topic, I have come out of that conversation feeling like I've made my point quite well. And that comes down to the uh, copious amounts of Islamic teachings that I have to refer to. And knowledge really is power. Um, so I've had, had people challenge me in some very straightforward ways, um, and they'll say things like, well, there's a reason why uh, halal exists, or are you saying that our prophet, peace be upon him, who ate meat was wrong? And so 
you know, they're very inflammatory type of statements that uh, they're gaslighting, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. And, um, but because I have a response for that, um, and I understand the topic at hand, I'm able to articulate myself in a manner that I'm satisfied with. They might not hear me. Um, they might not want to hear me. Um, but I've definitely uh, gotten to a point now where I, I definitely have an answer. And so I appreciate all the knowledge that others have put online for me to find uh, that have provided me with, with this uh, resource and this, this power to be able to articulate. Um, one major thing that comes up again and again in the Muslim community is um, Eid. We have an Eid, uh, which is, um, according to many Islamic scholars, mandates the slaughtering of an animal. However, there are other Islamic scholars, few, who have said you can give in charity, you don't need to slaughter an animal. Um, but the most powerful thing is there's an incredible website called veganmuslims.com. And um, there have been some individuals who've put together content that is so thoroughly detailed in why that teaching exists in Islam and what it actually means, which is to sacrifice something dear to you, not necessarily an animal. Um, and so I'm just grateful that that material is out there that has provided us with these answers that we're able to respond to people with and share knowledge with. Yeah, that's that's really, really important. So you are, it sounds like you have a lot of that information in your head, which mm -hmm. really, uh, that's a lot of work to get all that uh, memorized. And But it's so important because it makes people think, even if they don't change right then. So mm -hmm. you've planted a lot of seeds. Um, so tell us about the film, Halalified. What is it about and uh, how can we uh, see it? Is it online? It is not online yet. It is an early production phase. Um, oh, we, okay. have, we have uh, 45 vegan Muslims from all over the globe who are willing to participate in this film. I'm not sure at the end uh, what it will look like, but we're in conversation now. I've been looking for a director and I think I finally found the right director for the film. Um, so the pieces are coming together slowly but surely um, because we need a resource that people can refer to quickly that is uh, wholesome content. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, many people have objections with veganism in general because they will be concerned about protein intake or calcium or B12, um, or that animals are on earth here for us to eat, according to them. Um, but then there's also, but Islam says, but the Quran says, but Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, did. And so there, there's that set of objections as well that one needs to respond to in the Muslim community. And so Halalified aims to address animal rights in Islam the environment, uh, as well as food equity and the social justice aspect of that, um, health, as well as food. Because once we do all this learning, then what do we eat now? And it's really important to be able to share with the Muslim community foods that, um, quite frankly, traditionally are already vegan um, and really easy to, to consume. It's really the last uh, many years have brought about this uh, sort of um, ubiquity in, in animal foods all over the place. And so it doesn't have to be that way. And, and so it's just bringing back that knowledge and highlighting how most of the traditional foods, quite frankly, um, are vegan or can be easily veganized. Now that's so important because people don't wanna leave their traditional foods. And, and so that's really great that you've incorporated that. And um, but I'm thinking uh, too that it sounds like you're going to also show the connection between social justice and environmental justice with veganism because it's so intertwined. And uh, as far as <clears throat> um, just the, simply the fact that there isn't enough land. <clears throat> to grow all these animals mm -hmm. and and 
all of the, the social justice issues around people who work in slaughterhouses and all these things. So um, so that'll be part of the film too. Yes. That's that sounds great. Yeah. Because I think when people see that connection, it maybe gives them another motivation <clears throat> to go begin. I agree. I, I agree. I, I would hope so. And um, another thing that's really interesting is that uh, the climate crisis is definitely impacting the global south um, more than those of us in the global north. And um, the Middle East, uh, South Asia, uh, they're, they're feeling the African countries are feeling the onslaught of the climate crisis even more so uh, than we are. And I think that that's a concern for them. And so I'm hoping that education around uh, the role food systems play in the environment and the current climate crisis we have before us will also be quite enlightening. Um, have you heard Silas Rao speak about that very issue? <laughs> yeah. um, he's not Muslim, but he might uh, uh, be able to add something to the film because uh, he's got a lot of really good data. Mm -hmm. It's all true. that together. Yeah. So um, we we are really excited about you being on the panel at the the. Uh, um, world religions, the Parliament of World Religions that is happening in Chicago in August. And for anybody who's listening doesn't know, we submitted a bunch of different uh, programs and most, almost all of them got accepted. So uh, we're, we're really going to get the vegan word out at this parliament, which attracts people from all over the world. And the last one we went to where we had a table, an information table um, was in Toronto actually, and not far from where you are now. And uh, there were 8,000 people there. Now, I, and so I'm imagining that it'll be something like that and we'll have a table and then all of these presentations. And Zara is going to be on the panel the one uh, that we're calling Engaging Communities to Inspire Compassion for All. And clearly you are right in the middle of doing that. Uh, what are some of the things that you wanna talk about on the panel? I think um, there's one, one of the things, um, since the tragedy of 9-11, um, Muslims in North America, have had a very interesting um, um, identity. I, I don't even have the right words, actually. Um, I, I just know that I was Muslim. And then after 9-11, I was Muslim. Like it, it was a thing. And um, there were a lot of concerns, uh, stereotypes, um, things like that, that um, have, have become very much part of our identity. And so, I found myself oftentimes advocating within my community for um, social justice causes. And then I found myself advocating outside of my, my uh, religious community and with my greater community in regards to um, all the wonderful things about Islam that are not necessarily always reflected in the Muslim community or all the wonderful things about moderate Muslims, which is the vast majority of us, um, and it always felt a little bit like a struggle, a little exhausting. I have to defend Muslims and then I have to argue with the Muslims as well. <laughs> and um, <laughs> it's what I'm really excited about uh, at this uh, event is when I speak about how, how significant compassion is in Islam, I find that for those that are unfamiliar with the teachings, um, I certainly have a, a moment of uh, clarity and building bridges and understanding. Um, and then for those that are from within the community, they also, it serves as a reminder that just because 
something is labeled as halal doesn't mean we have divine permission to consume it. It is not grounded in Islamic ethics and teachings at all today. It is simply grounded in greed and business and money <laughs> and nothing else. Um, so, so I love that I get to talk about this and, and how um, it's for the vast majority of people, I find um, a, a new topic uh, for, for most of them. Okay, so this will this will just be great. This will uh, make it a really powerful panel, I believe. Uh, I'm thinking I'm looking at the time, uh, Lisa. Uh, maybe we should open for questions. Sure. Well, first of all, I want to thank you so much, Sarah. This was very enlightening for me. I loved hearing your knowledge about um, green Muslim and the ethics and the, the spirit of, of um, Islamic philosophy and religion. It's just been um, very educational and also uplifting for me to hear about this. And also I think it's very, uh, it, it brings us to that, that core of what happens when we're vegan and we're in, we're in these communities where we're both the insider and the outsider, you know, where we are, um, in the world advocating for, for um, our traditions and then in, within our tradition advocating for veganism and how those, those um, identities that we have of ourselves uh, play with one another. So I think it was very powerful that you spoke about that. It, it, um, I feel a lot of compassion for all of us and especially for you given what you're sharing about some of the um, the very serious political issues and social issues going on in in um, in the world, especially after 9/11. So, being able to to weave all of that together. So, thank you for being open with us. Of course, and thank you, thank you for inviting me to this conversation. It's um, not just a ton of fun, but also such a great learning experience for me as well. So, thank you. Well, let's see what sort of questions we have. It looks like. Um, there's a question from Ume who asks, I wonder if Sarah would like to comment on uh, Sarah hmm, Tilley's <laughs> and Anna Gade's academic works on animals, environmentalisms, and in the context of Islam. Excellent question. Um, no specific comments, to be, to be honest. It's inspiring every time I read work on uh, Islam's, uh, you know, very clear instructions on caring for animals and the environment. Um, I think that the Muslim community has a long way to go to really not just um, understand, but to truly manifest the teachings of Islam and to practice that in our lifestyles. It can be uh, really easy to go along with what everyone else is doing. Um, and it can be really tough to uh, be vegan or even vegetarian within the Muslim community because uh, the common culture uh, is so meat heavy right now. Um, and so it's really great that they're, they're uh, creating this work um, and putting out this work. It helps empower people like me, activists like me, who um, are communicating with the public out there. Um, it, it, as I said earlier, knowledge is power, and this is where we get our knowledge from. So. Thank you so much, Sarah, for addressing that <laughs> in your own way. You know, um, there are some other comments people are really um, saying hello, <laughs> and also um, some folks are curious about how to contact you, how to reach you, and what would be the best way to do that? I put my email address uh, right there in the chat. So please feel free to email me. You can also find me on all social media really easily. Facebook, uh, Instagram are probably the most common that I use, but I'm also on LinkedIn and I pop up quite easily. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. And let's see. Um, there was a question also, what was the name of, oh gosh, um, 
it says here of that again. <laughs> so what was the name of something that was vegan that was mentioned? It was from Donna. So I don't know, Donna, if you'd like to type in your question so we can answer that for you. That would be great. Um, yes, Donna was asking about the name of the website, I believe. Okay. Um, I've also typed that in the chat. Yes, that. Mm -hmm. good. So that was the, that was the, there is the Vegan Muslims website and also Green Islam, which is coming. And do you have a sense of when that might go live? In about a couple of months, we're hoping. Yes. Wonderful. And can you share a little bit about the, the founding of, of Green Islam? I mean, are there other people involved that, that you are um, collaborating with? Absolutely. Um, Ellie is uh, a lovely human that I met through um, research for Halalophyte, actually. Um, she's doing her PhD in Southampton, the UK, um, on uh, veganism with, in, in regards to her, in their relationship with uh, Judaism, Christianity, and uh, Muslims. And uh, Ellie and a couple of other people had started chatting about uh, putting an organization together. I was working on Halalified. It just made sense to um, merge together and uh, create Green Islam. And so Ellie and I have been uh, heavily involved uh, with the assistance of a number of other volunteers um, in uh, getting Green Islam organized. We attended a phenomenal class, a course by ProVeg uh, International. Uh, and that helped us put together um, the strategic plan for Green Islam. And now we're, we've just got to do the legwork and it's a lot of legwork, but I think at the end of it all, uh, there will be uh, an amazing website, an amazing resource uh, that we can hopefully use to inspire many people and answer a lot of people's questions and concerns as well. Thank you, Sarah. We have a couple of other questions that popped up. One from Lisa, another Lisa Vincent. And she's um, asking, she's curious about the similarities between Islam and Christianity regarding the treatment of animals. Um, and just if you happen to know about those, any, any comment? Absolutely. Um, I was on a panel, I think a year and a half ago, um, which was uh, specific to animals in various religions and uh, veganism, uh, its relationship with those religions. And so um, it was really exciting to meet someone from both the Jewish faith and the Christian faith, where we um, were just constantly comparing notes one person would say well it says this and in the bible or you know and I'd be like yes it says something so similar in the Quran and so it was just a really uh wonderful time uh comparing notes I don't remember those teachings uh or the, or uh the conversation we engaged in verbatim now uh, but I remember the excitement that we all felt um as we heard each other speak and found it so incredibly relatable uh to our own faith mm -hmm. Well, that's beautiful. And I know that comes back to the golden rule and how it's actually um, uh, in so many different languages, there's a version of that, uh, maybe a little adapted and in many different traditions. So that's uh, also about the core, the, the heart of these different traditions around the world and how they, they come back to love, they come back to compassion, and then we can extend it to, to animals too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's another question. Um, do you, Sarah, uh, observe any kind of gender gap between women and men um, when it comes to veganism and activism for veganism? So, uh, so she's or curious about that. I don't know if that's something you could speak to. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, what's interesting is that um, when I'm in vegan gatherings, I think there are there tend to be um, a, a slight veering towards more females in any given group. Um, not not extensively. There's definitely a lot more men in vegan gatherings than I had anticipated originally, to be honest. So I'm quite impressed, um, and that is because, as we all know. 
there are so many ideas around masculinity and eating animals. And so uh, lots of lots to, to unpack there, but um, we won't do that just now. Um, but it's definitely something that I thought would discourage uh, more men than I'm grateful to see it has. Um, however, in the Muslim community, I'm finding a similar reflection, actually, in our Green Islam team, we've had more men uh, interested in volunteering for our organization than I had anticipated. And uh, I, I think it's quite nice to see. It's hard to find vegan Muslims as is, um, but I think the ones that uh, I did find for Halalified uh, were mostly men. And I thought that was really exciting. <laughs> Yeah, that's fantastic. That is um, very heartening. And uh, also given some of those um, masculinity concepts that come up, I think that's really important that things are shifting and changing all around the world. It's great. Yeah. We do have another question um, from Donna. Can you think of Muslim principles that are directly counter to eating meat? Um, is there a way is it the way that the animals are raised and slaughtered? It's um, the raising and slaughtering of animals uh, fall under the uh, principles of halal. So halal means permissible. And um, there are a ton of rules around what is permissible in terms of if we're slaughtering an animal, that, light, that animal cannot see another slaughtered. Uh, which is not happening in most of the halal facilities I know of or the halal practices I've seen in the Muslim countries. Um, an animal cannot see blood, smell blood, um, hear the slaughter, any of that. Um, an animal cannot be tied down. Um, so there, there's actually a lot of rules that are just simply not followed. Um, and I think another thing that's uh, quite jarring is, um, for me at least, is that halal is now syn synonymous with zabiha. So the concept of zabiha is um, basically uh, cutting the jugular vein and draining all the blood out before consuming the meat. And this concept has now, and saying a prayer, of course, as you cut the jugular vein. So this concept have, has become synonymous with halal and all the other rules of halal have just completely been forgotten. And um, it's, it's not pleasant to see, but I find that when I speak on the topic, people do listen and understand. They might not give up meat, but they do agree. So the teachings are there and they're indisputable. Um, but because culture and uh, what's convenient and what's most common and what is understood to be traditional, is um, so easy for, for people to lean on. Um, they don't necessarily change their lifestyles, although they will agree. Uh, I've, I've never had anyone disagree uh, about compassion for animals and, and, the, and the rules of halal in, in extensive detail. Well, thank you for that eloquent answer <laughs> of the very challenging question in terms of the specifics. Um, so another question from uh, Kathleen is, uh, Zara, how do you think that plant-based meats and cellular agriculture will impact the worldwide Muslim um, Uma, or hopefully I'm saying that right? What will the scholarship say about these things? That's a really good question. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Um... I'm also equally intrigued to, to see um, what happens in that regard. I think, um, I think we'll just have to wait and see. I don't really know. I feel like some will uh, say it's perfectly fine, it's okay. Um, and others might, um, you know, the, the Muslim community is just so vast. There's 2 billion of us. And you can find someone saying just about anything within the community. <laughs> so it really, I, I think uh, that's how, that's the most challenging uh, question, I think, because we're just not one homogenous group. There's, there are going to be Islamic leaders on every side of that conversation. 
And there's another question, possibly our last one from um, Chris, and she's asking, do you have to give up something that you love or care about? Is that part of the, the, um, the teachings related to the sacrifice? Um, the teachings related to the sacrifice are no longer about that, sadly. So I believe, and uh, other vegan Muslims, I believe, believe that uh, there, there's um, the, the concept of the sacrifice is uh, more metaphorical than, you know, you just slaughter an animal and call it a day. Um, it's rather quite vacuous today in, in its, uh, in its action, um, because a lot of people just give money. They're not doing the sacrifice themselves. You just give the money and then somebody slaughters it for you and distributes, uh, the animal parts. It's, um, very traumatizing, I think, for young people to witness. I know for myself, when I saw that as a child, it was confusing, um, and I didn't quite understand it, uh. And the animals are not happy, and we can see that because they're being tied down, which we're not supposed to do in Islam. We're killing them in front of one another, which we're not supposed to do in Islam. There's so many things that that don't jive, right, with the teachings of Islam. And so it's been uh, simplified into this action that the vast majority of people believe um, is mandated in the religion. And the, the problem is with the leadership. The leadership will tell they have very little understanding of um, there, there's a lot of romanticism around Islamic teachings, but that romanticism doesn't translate into actionable sacrifices today. Um, and I would relate that also to women's rights. It's no secret that, um, you know, Muslim countries are not doing too well in, in, in that area at all. And yet Islamic teachings um, brought equal rights for women. And uh, a lot of uh, property rights and, uh, you know, the right to ask for divorce. And it was very progressive when Islam came. It was extremely progressive for women. Um, but that has completely been lost in translation throughout the years. Um, and so while we romanticize a lot of, oh, we have these incredible, powerful figures in Islamic history, female figures in Islamic history, um, that's not something that's reflected in the countries where Islam is even being exported from, where the where the religious teachings are being exported from. And so we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> and um, the sacrifice of animals, uh, I believe falls, falls in that category of, you know, things have gotten lost in translation and um, even our own religious leaders uh, don't know how to necessarily comprehend these issues uh, and then to address these issues. Wow, <laughs> that is um, a very deep question, I think, for not only uh, in the Islamic tradition, but in many different traditions. I know um, Judy and I have been at Unity Village talking to um, some of the people there within that tradition about the, the differences between the founders who, who embraced um, animals as um, sentient beings and uh, refrain from eating them and how that has gotten lost in translation over the years. And now some people in within that, um, that religion are trying to bring it back. And so I think that's part of this beautiful revival within many of these um, religions is to bring back that concept of animal sentience and all of the wonderful progressive work that was done to try to reduce animal suffering. So hopefully we'll, that conversation will be able to continue at places like the Parliament of the World's Religions where we'll be able to engage um, with many different um, people uh, from their religious perspective on that concept of um, finding those vegan values that, that are within their tradition that align with their original messages. That was beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Oh yeah, we'll get to share more at the Parliament of the World's Religions and we really invite everybody who's here to join. It's um, a wonderful event and there'll be plenty of vegan advocacy going on there. So you're welcome to, to join us. It'll be in Chicago and we hope, we hope to see you there. We'll have a table and a wonderful religious observances and workshops and panels and 
and also Sarah will, will be there too with us. So you get to talk to her more. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to take a moment and just, uh, oh, there may be one more question here. Is there, is there any particular vegan, a Muslim majority country, which is doing particularly better than others in terms of veganism? Yes, I believe I believe Turkey is doing a pretty solid job. Uh, Turkey has a few veg fests uh, that are quite popular. Turkey has uh, vegan stores and uh, restaurants, um, and they're just already really quite well known to uh, care for cats. Every store, uh, you know, has their has a cat. Every hotel has a cat. It's it's really quite extraordinary. Um, the dogs that, that are street dogs are very well fed and taken care of as well. So Turkey is doing a pretty solid job in this regard. Um, and I know the vegan activists in Turkey have made quite a lot of headway with various animal rights issues as well. Various campaigns have been quite successful. Um, so I think that's, that's a country that uh, for me is, is quite inspirational. I wish this list was a little longer, but that's where it starts and ends for me right now. <laughs> Well, thank you. It's good to know that there is, is a country to, that in a way is providing a model for others uh, in, in that um, vegan advocacy. And that's, that's, that's what it starts. I mean, it has to start somewhere. And that is wonderful to hear that there's a place already out there <laughs> that's beginning to thrive with vegan um, options and vegan advocacy and um, a place to, to look up for and probably to travel for for um, vegan travelers. So, wow, well, gosh, I wanna take this moment to, to thank you, Azira. This has been just such a fantastic conversation, one that I'll always remember. And I appreciate your um, ability to convey all of these concepts in such a loving uh, manner. And I think that you will spread peace to all beings wherever you go. Thank you, Lisa, and yeah. Judy, and everyone. Yes. Well said, Lisa. I completely agree. Thank you, Zira, so much. Uh, I did find a little quote to share that kind of goes along with all this, the good news uh, that Zira has shared with us. And it's from Henry David Thoreau. And he said, I have no doubt that it is part of the destiny of the human race in its gradual improvement to leave off eating animals. So I thought that was kind of an uplifting quote to end on. Oh, thank you, Judy, so, so much. We really appreciate it. It's nice to have an uplifting, uplifting vegan message after this fantastic conversation. And we hope that this conversation kind of starts some, some wheels turning for everyone and in many different ways and having compassion for people in different religions um, and also bringing in that idea of a vegan advocacy into places where we didn't expect it. So um, thank you so, so much. And I guess sometimes we have a namaste vegan, but we could adapt that for whatever tradition you want to go with <laughs> and just, um, Thanks to everybody in all corners of the planet who's joined us today. We really appreciate your presence and also your, um, your lifestyle choice of compassion for all beings. And we hope to um, stay united together in, in, in many of our common ground ways and also to respect and appreciate all of our differences. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> stay vegan. Stay yeah. vegan. We'll see you in August at the Parliament. Woohoo! <laughs> Hope to see everyone there. And if not, we'll see you again at one of these online gatherings. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Good night, all. Bye, everybody. Been wonderful. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah.